Hello. I'm here today to tell you about thorium nuclear reactors. There's always been a controversy on is this something everyone should go and rush and embrace, or is it eh, interesting idea, doesn't matter. Well, let's find out. Here's the basic idea. We mine thorium, element in the ground, slightly radioactive, meaning an extremely long, many billions of years half-life. We then expose the thorium in the nuclear reactor to create U-233. Thorium isn't our uh, fissile thing. It's not the thing that's splitting up. We have to make uranium-233 first. How do you do that? Well, let me show you on this chart. So here is thorium-233. And in a nuclear reactor, I have lots of neutrons. So this type of symbol means a neutron comes in, a gamma ray comes out. Now, rarely it will go this way. This chance of this reaction, the neutron-to-neutron -neutron reaction, is lower. Okay, So most of the time it goes this way, it makes thorium-233. We've added a neutron. But this is very unstable, and in 22 minutes it decays to protactinium-233. Now, protactinium-233 could get hit by more neutrons and go this way or go this way, but most of the time it will sit and simply beta decay in 27 days to uranium-233. And the uranium-233 is the fuel you want, the fissile fuel that you want. Just to point out a couple things on this graph that we'll come back to in a few moments. In a nuclear reactor, these N2N reactions and these N gamma reactions do occur because I got lots of neutrons around. So I am going to end up with some uranium-232. And since its half-life is 71 years, it's definitely going to sit around. And it turns out that this can be a huge advantage because you can't make a bomb if you've got even tiny bits of U-232. But we'll come back to that. What else is the basic idea? Now that we've made U-233, we're going to run it in a reactor cycle with thorium and have a system where we make more U-233 then we use. This is a breeder reactor. It's not magic. You are using up thorium, but you make more U-233 on each cycle. So once you get one going, you suck out the extra U-233. You can start another reactor going. You can start another reactor going. That's our basic idea. It works because if I look at the fission cross-section, the chance of making a fission a log scale here, and this is a log scale on the energy of the neutron. Whether I have U-233, U-235, plutonium-239, and there's one more fissile element, plutonium-240, okay, they all have a very similar cross-section in terms of the ability to make fissions. Why do it? Why bother doing this? What are the big advantages? Well, the first one is that thorium is three to four times more abundant than uranium. And the mining process, the extraction process, is easier. Okay? It's good. The second is that in this breeding, I can make U-233, my fuel, more easily from thorium then the alternative breeder reactor, the kind that was the Phoenix and Super Phoenix power plant in France, which is making plutonium-239 out of uranium-238. Because it's easier to do that, I can more easily use a really cool reactor concept called a molten salt reactor. 
and molten salt reactors are arguably one of the safest systems to do this in, and I'll show you why. First, let me illustrate that point about the breeding. In thermal neutrons, which were here, this is the absorption of U-238, which would lead to plutonium. This is the absorption of thorium-233, which leads to U-233. And this is probably, um, um, you know, four times higher. And that's a significant difference. The molten salt reactor is a very interesting concept because I take my fuel, my uranium and thorium, and I make a salt out of them. Uranium fluoride or thorium fluoride. And those salts, like a crystal of salt, you can melt them. You do that by having them very hot. I would have molten salt going through here, right? It will fission, and then I cycle it through, and I can remove the fission products and add in more thorium, maybe even take out some of that excess U-233, and continually fuel this. It gets very hot, and I have to cool it, okay? But the fact that it gets very hot is a safety feature. Because just by gravity, I have a passive safety feature with this freeze plug. I have something here that will melt at a certain temperature. And if this hot salt gets too hot, it melts this plug and all of the fuel drains off into the safe dump tanks filled with neutron absorbers, absolutely designed to stop the fission runaway reaction. And since any runaway or difficult reaction or out of control reaction is gonna make it hotter, this thing instantly melts, it falls away, and we have a much more passively safe system. Is it all roses? Well, remember, this is a very hot molten salt. We'll put another loop of it in the way to try to get where water has to be involved with this further from the reactor. And eventually we put steam through here and we run your turbines and everything else like any other power plant. This works particularly well in the thorium cycle, but you can do a molten salt reactor with uranium-235 as well. One more thing of why bother doing this, and that's because the waste products produced are shorter lived than those from the uranium or plutonium cycles. When you break up uranium or plutonium, you get fission products. Those are the two halves that are left. They're radioactive, but they will decay away. And if I talk about the uranium coming out of the ground as being my kind of safe level, you can see that the fission products decay in two to 300 years. The thing that lets you have extremely long-lived radioactive waste are the elements heavier than uranium, transuranium, transuranics. These elements have very long half-lives, and so it could be 100,000 years before they're down to the natural uranium ore levels. This is from uranium-235. That's this curve, this actinide from uranium curve. Down here is the actinides from thorium orders of magnitude less. They have the same fission products, but on this graph, the thorium actinides would cross this line at a much, much earlier state, meaning that your radioactive waste would not need to be isolated for as long. And the last thing of why to bother doing this is that it's difficult to make bombs from the material in the reactor due to this U-232. I think I can best explain that over on a document camera. I don't have my squeaky markers, so this is the best I can do. I'm going to start with thorium-232, naturally abundant thorium. I put it in the nuclear reactor. I add neutrons to it, right? 
and I make thorium-233. And um, it will decay very uh, quickly, uh, 22 minutes, all right? And it makes protactinium-233. So this is 22 minutes. Okay, we have a different chemical now, protactinium-233. Well, it has a half-life, it's T1 half, is 27 days. And this gets you to U233, and that's the fuel that you want. That's your, your fissile material, all right? The thing is that, remember, I'm doing all this because I am in this neutron environment, right? And there are reactions with neutrons that can lead this to U-232. There are act reactions with neutrons that can lead this to 232. And so if it's all sitting in a reactor, I can't help but make some uranium-232, which is a bomb poison. I'm not going to be able to make a nuclear weapon if I've got even a little bit of U-232. So you might say, well, this is great. You can't divert the fuel and steal it and go make bombs. Well, can you? You see, 27 days is pretty long. So what if we take this fuel and just separate out the protactinium? Forget about all the uranium I've already made. Forget about this neutron poison. Just separate out the protactinium and wait. 27 days later, you've got half of it turned into U-233, which you can chemically separate. So if you want to make a fissile fuel, right, U-233, U-235, plutonium-239, and plutonium-241, those are your fissile fuels. All of those could make bombs. There is actually a way to do it with these reactors. Still, you got lots of good things on the plus end, right? What about the negative side? Why should you not bother developing the thorium reactor cycle? Well, first, we're not going to run out of uranium-238. It might be three or four times less abundant than thorium, but there is an enormous amount of it on the planet considering that nuclear reactors don't use very much. Secondly, the molten salt reactor is cool. I mean, it's a great way to do things. But there are passively safe ways to finish finishing U-235, even a molten salt reactor. So that reactor concept might work a little better with thorium, but it will work, and there are safe ways, passively safe ways, to do the fission we do today. And while it is true that the amount of wastes from this cycle does not have to be isolated from humans for as long, both nuclear systems, the stuff that makes 20% of electricity in the world today, or an advanced cycle like the thorium one, make a tiny amount of waste in comparison to all of our other energy sources. And so even if you need to isolate it and 100 years later you need to re-isolate it and you need to watch it, it could be those transuranics become very useful things or maybe they even become reactor fuel. And then finally, governments make nuclear weapons and any big enough government can figure out how to do it. We have not been kept safe from nuclear war because it's so hard to make a nuclear weapon. We've been kept safe from nuclear war because people have decided not to use them. So whether or not you could make it more easily from U-233 or not, or plutonium from uranium or not, those questions of proliferation, the solution to them is not in this technological realm, but rather in the political realm.
But in the end, it all comes down to economics. Just like so many of the other lectures up here from Illinois Energy Prof, you've got to look at the money. If we went back 50 years, maybe developing the thorium U-233 cycle would have been a better choice for commercial power. But the thing is, we've had 60 years of experience in operating the U-235 commercial reactors. And that means so many technological problems have been solved. We have figured out how to do this. We can do it at scale. We understand it. We've been putting in improvements right along, including the Gen 3 reactors being built today that have the pace of passive safety. And this has been done at a competitive price. I mean, when oil is $11 a barrel, nothing is competitive. But generally, we can do this at a competitive price. And if we had to do this all over again, we had to build up all the new technology, if we had to build up these things, these arguments were starting over, doesn't have enough compelling economic argument to justify the costs, at least in my opinion. Now, don't get me wrong, we should research this. There should be demo plants and demonstration experiments and in examinations into the details of the economics and the technology. We certainly should be doing research still on this cycle. It could potentially be useful in the long-term view, hundreds of years view of uh, human society. But today saying, ah, let's just start on this new cycle over, I don't see where you're going to make that argument with dollars and cents. That's what you need to know about thorium nuclear reactors.